All right, welcome back, Mac 1330 Fluid Power. We're going to get into Chapter 4 in your book, Hydraulic Cylinders, all right? So we're going to talk about all the different uh, parts of a cylinder, speed, power, flow, learn all the different symbols for all the different types of cylinders and, you know, different applications that we can use them in, okay? So, cylinders, okay? First thing we want to talk about was what an actuator. An actuator converts the fluid power back into mechanical power, okay? We use two things for the most part. One is a cylinder and the other is a motor, all right? And we turn, we use that fluid power and turn it into either our linear actuator, which is our cylinder, so we get lines in a straight motion, all right? Whether it's like a, an x-axis or it can be a vertical axis as well, or we can get our rotary actu actuators, which are motors, so we get a rotational motion out of that. Okay. We also have double acting cylinders that can produce forces in both directions. But we're going to get into those parts a little bit more uh, sooner. But, you know, one of the outputs of uh, an actuator that we're going to get into in this chapter is strictly all cylinders. We're going to talk about uh, motors in a different uh, chapter and things like that as well. Okay, so different parts of the hydraulic cylinder. All right, we got the blind end, the rod end, the piston rod. We can see the barrel. The blind end, okay, we call it the blind end because it's not the end that has something coming in or out of it, okay? So we use motion produced by either applying, you know, fluid inside the blind end port, all right, to extend the, uh, the piston, or we put fluid inside the rod end port to retract the piston, all right, and we use that to make it go back and forth. We attach the load to the rod, Okay, on the piston rod, um, we can use that to lift loads or push loads, all right? And cylinders, they're welded or threaded caps are called common, okay? So the piston extends from the left side to the right side as we're like pushing here, okay? So we're extending to the left, we're retracting to the right, okay? So like I said before, this is a cutaway, I'm going to go through the same thing. We put fluid in the blind end port to extend Okay, the piston or the cylinder. Because if you look inside, there's a piston head in there. And then we create two chambers. See the bore diameter? That's how we're going to size our cylinders in a little bit when we talk about that. But inside the blind end is where we put all the fluid to extend the piston. And then when we want to retract it, all right, we're going to evacuate all the fluid from the blind end and put a bunch of fluid in from the rod end and that'll put a force against that piston, all right, and actually retract the piston rod, okay? So these are kind of the cutaways. So make sure that you understand what all these different parts are. The rod seal is very important, all right? It keeps the fluid from escaping or going, you know, leaking out through the piston rod every time we extend and retract it, okay? We have a rod bearing so that it can turn and roll in and out nicely. Okay, and also supplies support for the shaft as well. We have a rod wiper. Okay, that keeps particles from getting in or out, all right, uh, as well on that piston rod. It keeps it clean so when we retract, you know, anything that's out floating in the air where we were working doesn't get on the rod, okay? So all different parts uh, important. We have the piston seal. The piston seal, very important so that we don't leak fluid from either the blind end to the rod end chambers so that the, uh, the piston can continuously hold the pressure uh, for everything. Okay, so extending, we call it the working stroke, okay? So as you can see below, the arrows here in the, in the picture are indicating, okay, I'm putting fluid in the blind end and extending the piston, filling up that chamber literally with hydraulic oil. Then when we retract, like I've been talking about, we put it in the rod end, we're flowing fluid into that end, and we're evacuating stuff out of the other end of the chamber, okay, back to the tank, okay? So when we talk about return flow, it's gonna return to the tank, all right? Because we've talked about all that system being there. And this is with the hydraulic piece. If we're getting into pneumatics, right, we can vent that stuff into the atmosphere. It's not a big deal. but. With hydraulics, everything's a closed loop system. So we, ref we put it back into the tank and we pull from the tank at the same time 
and fill the other end of the cylinder. Okay, and I'll demonstrate that in class uh, as well. No new equation here, okay? Pressure is force over area, or force equals pressure times area. So we have our extending force, which is pressure times area, okay? And when we do this, we're going to use the area of the bore diameter. That's the opening that the piston is sitting in, okay, when we do these calculations. So let's do a simple calculation. We have a cylinder that has a bore diameter of 4 inches and a rod diameter of 1.5 inches required to extend against a load of 12,000 pounds. What pressure is required? It's important that we know the two different ends, okay? Because I'm going to step back a couple slides here real quick. If we take a look at this, okay, or even this one, can we see that the rod consumes some of the area? So the chamber with the rod side has less volume than the chamber without the rod sticking in it. Okay, so when we're fully extended, that chamber doesn't have the rod in there. But when we're fully retracted, all right, that rod is sitting in there, taking up some of the chamber area. So that's why it's important that we understand when we have the piston size and the rod size, because we're going to have to find that difference between the two when we actually have to find that side of the chamber, okay? So that'll be important coming up. So first thing first, though, you know, stepping back to chapter two, we have to find the areas, okay? That's still pi d squared over four, okay? When we calculate that, and then once we know the area, we're given the force, so we're going to take force divided by area and get our pressure, and since this one is in imperial units, it's PSI or pounds per square inch, okay? Now, the whole point of this is, it's only going to balance the load. This is not going to move the load, okay? So we've got to be a little bit stronger pressure to actually move the load, okay? So we can increase that pressure to 1,000 PSI. You know, even if we bump it to like 960 PSI, it'll start to move the load. All right. A cylinder with a bore diameter of 4 inches and a rod diameter of 1.5 inches is required to retract, okay? So now we're retracting. This is where it goes back to the slides I talked about a few minutes ago, where we actually have to incorporate the rod side, okay? Because remember, that chamber is the chamber that's being affected now. So we have to calculate the area of the piston and the area of the rod in this scenario. So we're doing this when we're retracting. When we're extending, we just needed the area of the piston because all the fluid is going to push against the piston. But now when we're retracting, all the fluid is going to push against the piston, but there's not as much fluid because the rod is in the way. Okay, so that's the area of the rod. So now when we do this pressure, we're going to take the force to retract, which is 700 pounds, divided by the difference in the areas, the bore diameter area and the actual rod area. Okay, so that does make a difference when we are retracting. You have to find a difference in the areas because... The amount of area of where that fluid is, all right, is smaller when we're retracting than when we are extending our cylinder. Okay, a cylinder is required to extend against a load of 20,000 pounds with a maximum pressure of 1,800 PSI. What cylinder size is required? Okay, so this is a two-step problem. We have the force, we have the pressure, we have to find the area first. Then using the area, we find the cylinder size, okay? So finding the area first is force divided by pressure. Everything's in the right unit, so we can just take 20,000 divided by 1,800 and get 11.11. .11. Now that's the area. That's not the size. We size the cylinder based on the bore diameter, okay? So we actually have to solve the area equation for D, the diameter, okay? So I've done that algebraically for you. I'll show you how to do that on the board if we got asked. But all I did was use the area equation, area equals pi d squared divided by 4, and I solved it for the variable d, all right? When I do that, I get 4 times area of the piston divided by pi, and I square root that answer. So the size of the diameter is 3.76 inches. So that's the size of the cylinder uh, that we're looking for, okay? Next, we want to talk about cylinder speed. Remember, speed and velocity mean the same thing. 
So the preferred unit for flow in metrics is liters per minute, right, and gallons per minute in imperial or standard units. So we've talked about those before. Notice that 1,000 is back for metric and that 231 is back for our standard or imperial unit. So we've started on that in Chapter 2. We're carrying that all the way through. So now we're not finding the flow. The flow we're finding the velocity. Okay, remember Q is the flow itself. All right, but the V subscript D, that's the extension velocity. So that's the speed of the cylinder when we're extending. Okay, and the V subscript R, that's the speed of the cylinder when we are retracting. Notice we have to find the differences in the area when we are retracting, just like we had to use the difference in area when we were retracting, finding either the force or the pressure to retract in the previous examples. Okay, so make sure that you got those equations written down. Let's do an example. We have a cylinder with a bore diameter of 3 inches and a rod diameter of 1.5 inches. It is to be used in the system with a 20 gallon per minute pump. What are the extension and retraction speeds? So we're finding VE and VR. Okay, so first things first, right? We're finding the area of the piston and the area of the rod. So we're still using pi d squared over 4. We've been using that since chapter 2, okay? The extension velocity is going to be 231 times Q divided by AP. So Q in this case, it's 20 gallons per minute. So we're going to take 231 times 20 divided by 7.05, okay? So notice gallons are going to cancel, and we'll be left with inches per minute because we have inches cubed, and then there's an inches squared uh, when we do, um, you know, uh, rules or rules of exponents, inches cubed divided by inches squared, we subtract the exponents, so that's why we're left with inches. All right, so our extension speed, 655 inches per minute, all right, that's distance over time. And then if we do our retraction, same calculation, only look, the difference is in the denominator. We have to find the difference between the area of the piston and the area of the rod when we do that calculation, okay? So our retraction speed is faster than our extension speed because there's that difference in the area uh, right there. So you can see that we can just substitute in, all right? The only difference is when we're retracting, we have to find the differences in the area when we do these calculations. All right, let's do one in metric, all right? Everything's going to be the same as far as equation-wise for the most part, other than we're going to use that 1,000 instead of 231 type scenario. But look, we're given everything here in millimeters. We have to remember to convert back to meters in milli means we have to move the decimal three places. So, example, the cylinder with a bore diameter of 40 millimeters and a rod diameter of 10 millimeters is required to extend at a velocity of 0.5 meters per second. What is the flow rate to achieve this speed? So we gotta find Q. We have our extension velocity, okay, but we've gotta find Q. Still using the same equations, okay, but we have to find area of the piston Remember that 40 millimeters has to get converted to meters, so we move the decimal three places to the left. So 40 millimeters becomes 0 0.040 meters. All right, then we do pi d squared divided by 4 to get the area of the piston. We've got to convert to meters per minute. Okay, we were in meters per second, so we have to take 0 0.5 meters per second and multiply it by 60 seconds in one minute. Remember, seconds are going to cancel there. So we're left with meters per minute, right? That's what we need for flow, okay? So that's our velocity of our extension, our extension velocity. Now we're gonna use the extension velocity and we're gonna use our area to find our flow, okay? So we're using the original equation, okay? Our extension velocity was Q divided by 1,000 times AP or the area of the piston equaled our extension velocity. We're using that equation but instead we have to solve it for Q. So Q equals 1,000 times our velocity, extension velocity, VE, times our area of our piston, which is AP. So we're going to take 1,000 times 30 times 0 0.00126, and we're going to get 37.7 liters per minute, right? So look, we have meters times meters squared, which is meters cubed, but divided by meters cubed, so the meters cancel out. All right, and we're just left with liters per minute, which is correct for us for flow velocity, okay? So, 
Do another example. We got a cylinder that's required to extend at a minimum speed of 0.65 meters per second in a system with a flow rate of 50 liters per minute. What cylinder size is required? Ah, you got to think. I got to find the area now, and then I got to find D. Okay, think about that. Anytime we're talking cylinder size, you got to find D. So make sure that that's in your notes that way. So first and foremost, we got to get to meters per minute because it was given to us in meters per second. So we have to take 0.65 meters per second times 60 seconds in one minute. That gives us 39 meters per minute. All right. We have to find our area now. Okay. We have our flow rate, which is 50 liters per minute, divided by 1,000 times our extension velocity. So we're going to take 50 divided by 1,000 times 39. Make sure when you do this equation, you do 50 divided by, in the denominator, put 1,000 times 39 in parentheses so your calculator doesn't screw it up for you. Uh, it doesn't know order of operations. You've got to force it to do that. Now, that's the area of the piston. We need to use the area to find the diameter. So we're going to use the equation area equals pi d squared over 4. Solve that for d like we did in a previous example, okay, which ended up being the square root of 4 times AP over pi, substitute in our given values, and we're going to get 0 0.040 meters. All right, we don't really talk about it in terms of meters because uh, you're not going to buy a 0 0.040 you know, meter uh, cylinder anywhere, but it comes out to be 40.4. You can get a 40 or a 45 millimeter um, cylinder and things like that. So move the decimal three places back to the right to put it back into millimeters. Okay. Now, with cylinder speed, cylinders usually don't leak, all right? So efficiency amongst these is actually pretty good, all right? They, I mean, if a cylinder leaks or blows, all right, the seal on that piston wears down, you have to replace the entire cylinder. You're not going to just get inside and fix one of those. So if, any, if that seal, like, leaks or leaks fluid onto the system, you got to replace the whole thing. All right, so let's just look at how cylinder power works. We have our prime mover all right, which was our electric motor. We have our pump, right, that the motor drove the pump and was pumping fluid, like we talked about pumps in Chapter 3. And then we're talking about the actuator right now being our cylinder, okay? So we're kind of looking at Chapters 1, 2, 3, or, um, or 2, 3, and 4, sorry, uh, as we take a look at this right now. Okay, and then we're going to get to our mechanical output, which is our load, whether we're pushing or pulling something or whether we're lifting it or setting it down or pressing something. All right, so different kind of concepts uh, when we go through there. So cylinder powers can, or cylinder power, all right? Cylinders convert fluid power from a pump into the linear motion. So I went through all that in the last slide with the diagram. If the moon of the piston is resisted by the load, the pressure will build until sufficient force is generated to overcome the load. We call that a stall. When the maximum pressure is not sufficient to overcome the load, right? It, can, it can't move the load, so it's stalled out, okay? It's just not strong enough to do it. So we have to be able to calculate the hydraulic power necessary to overcome just holding the load, but actually moving the load, okay? So the piston's moving under load, we're transmitting power, okay? So the two equations for power, okay? Hydraulic horsepower is P times Q divided by 1714. If we're talking imperial, if we're talking metric, it's KW, hydraulic, which is P times Q divided by 60, or 60,000, all right? And then we have cylinder output power, so HP out, okay, subscript O, is force times velocity divided by 550, and kilowatt output, okay, is force times velocity divided by 1,000. So make sure that you got those equations down here. So we're going to do a couple examples. We have a cylinder required to move 10,000 pound load at a velocity of three feet per second. What is the output power? Okay, so I'm gonna step back a slide. We're gonna use one of the two bottom equations, all right? And then this one's imperial, so we're gonna use the bottom one on the left. All right, so it's the output horsepower, right? It's force times velocity divided by 550. So it's gonna be 10,000 times three divided by 550. So we roughly need 54 horsepower for this one. Okay, we have a cylinder required to move a 3,500-pound load 20 inches in three seconds. What's the output power here? So we have to calculate the velocity first because it's not given to us, and that's distance over time. Okay, so we have to move 20 inches in three seconds, so it's 6.67 inches per second. So that's the velocity we need, 
And then we got to convert that to feet per second so that we're in the correct units to find our output horsepower. Okay, so it's 6.67 inches per second times in one foot. There's 12 inches, right? This way, inches cancel, and we're left with feet per second, so it's 0.555 feet per second. Okay, now we have everything we need to substitute into the equation correctly. So we take our force of 3,500 pounds times 0.555 and divided by 550, we get roughly 3.54 horsepower, okay? So that's the output power from that cylinder if we need to move a 3,500 pound load 20 inches in three seconds, okay? We might be pressing something or things like that. So once again, it's imperative when you do this calculation, put the numerator in parentheses and then divide by 550 in your calculator so that you can take care of order of operation issues when you do that, all right? Let's do one in metric. We got a cylinder is required to move a 15 kilonewton load 200 millimeters in 0.75 seconds, okay? What is the output power? Sorry, it should be saying seconds, not second. Uh, for all you grammatical English people that want to correct me, I get it. <laughs> so my bad on that one, so that is my mistake. All right, so a few things we need to notice here. 200 millimeters, right? That's gotta get converted to meters by moving the decimal three places when we do that. So we have to make sure that we find our velocity. So it's just like the last problem, distance over time. So that 200 millimeters moving the decimal place three places to the left gives us 0.2 meters. So it's gonna be 0.2 meters divided by 0.75 seconds. And now we're all in the right units. So we can find our output horsepower. All right, it shouldn't say output horsepower. It should say KW output equals F times V divided by a thousand. So I got a typo there, all right? It's not HP subscripto, it's KW subscripto. But it should be 15,000 times 0.267, all in parentheses, divided by a thousand. You should roughly get four KW output power, okay? So let's talk about what differential flow is. Okay, differential flow, that's the difference in the areas on the blind and rod end of the cylinder. The flow input is not the same as the flow output. And we'll talk about that later on when we talk about metering and stuff as well. All right, so we can meter in, meter out, and talk about the flow. So really, if we take a look, we have the Q return while extending, okay? Or the Q return while we're retracting and that sort of thing. Okay, so VR is retracting velocity, and VE is extension velocity when we do these equations here, okay? So we have a cylinder with a bore diameter of 5 inches and a rod diameter of 2 inches is to be used in a system with a 25-gallon pump. What are the return flow rates when the cylinder is extending and retracting? So those are our cues, right, because we're talking flow rates. So first things first, find the areas. That should be fundamental, pi d squared over 4 for us. All right, now we're literally going to just substitute into the uh, retracting, okay, extending piece equations that I just gave you. All right, so we're going to just substitute in our given values. All right, and we're going to get 21 gallons per minute, 29.76 gallons per minute. We're literally just plugging into the two equations on the last one. Just notice the first one, okay, uh, the cylinders when it's uh, extending. So the, the top one's extending, the bottom one's retracting. So that's the QRETE, QRETR, -E okay? R is the retracting, E is the extending. Okay, so we get 21 gallons per minute, 29.76 gallons per minute. All right, let's get into cylinder types. There's a bunch of different types of cylinders. We have a very common cylinder here. It's a double acting cylinder, very common, all right? Our 870 trainer, everybody on there is double acting except for like one cylinder, okay? It means we've got two ends to put fluid in to and out of, okay? So this is what a double acting is double acting cylinder, what it looks like, okay, on the inside, but it really means we've got our blind end and our port end, okay, and there's two methods to put fluid in. We can put it in the blind end of the port end, or we can send it out of the blind end of the port end, and that's how we make it extend and retract. A single acting cylinder, okay, is one that only has a blind end, Okay, so see how this one has two ports? Not necessarily going to work good on this. The picture I have isn't necessarily a good single-acting cylinder. But a single-acting cylinder 
acts under pressure in one direction and then returns automatically. Generally, we use a spring return cylinder, okay? So we use a force to extend the rod, and then when that force is gone, the spring returns it back to position, all right? So there's a push type that acts under pressure on the extend stroke, okay? And there's a pull type that acts under pressure on the retract stroke, okay? So either way, we return it using a spring. And that's depicted down in the bottom left-hand corner, all right? Whether we're extending or retracting, and whether we're using a push type or a pull type when we go through this, okay? We have single return, single acting cylinders, okay? On the left-hand side, though, there's your spring, all right? I know that one's pneumatic, more the fluid, but what happens is that cylinder is going to be pushed down under pressure, all right, and then return when that pressure is gone, all right? It's a spring return. We have a telescopic cylinder used when a long stroke and a short retracted length are required. So notice it looks like a telescope, right? It just keeps extending. We use it for a long stroke. Uh, example, right, raising a dump truck bed to dump dirt out. We have a double rod cylinder, okay, which means there's a rod on each end, all right, and work is done on both ends of these, okay, and they can withstand higher loads. So as one extends, the other retracts, uh, and vice versa. We have a tandem cylinder. We use a tandem cylinder when we have a large amount of force required to move you know, something with, uh, with a small diameter cylinder. So what's happening is, is notice there's two chambers to extend and two chambers to retract. So we're using twice as much force. With a tandem cylinder, uh, we're putting you know, into fluid into two ends to extend and two ends to retract on that case. Okay? We also have hydraulic ram presses. We have one in the back lab. Generate very high forces, all right? Has a shoulder instead of a piston, and it's generally less expensive. I got ours a little cheap boat, Harbor Freight. All right, but this is where we can press fit things and, and do other kinds of different cool stuff with that. Uh, you can press a mold or, or do th stamp things, you know, like Nissan has their big, like, 10 million pound press to stamp hoods and doors and that sort of thing. So that's where you might see those. You don't need to write all these down yet. I'm going to get to the ones that I want you to draw in a few minutes. But I want you to know that there's a lot of these symbols, and you're going to need to know all these symbols, okay, graph symbols, by the end of the semester, okay? So you'll need to know all these, all right? But we're going to kind of do them in chunks. And the reason you need to know them all, because if you're in the field or if you're designing something, this is what it looks like on a schematic. That's a lot, right? But if you break it down and you start to know all the different symbols and what they mean, you can actually understand everything that's going on on this drawing. Right now, you may not understand it all, okay? And that's fine. But we will by the end of the semester, okay, understand. All right, so all the different cylinders that I just talked about, we have a graphic symbol, okay? So we're going to draw all these and make sure you know all these on the test. So each one of these, I'm just kind of going to go through them fast, all right? But you need to know all the symbols, all right? So you see the double acting and the single acting cylinder symbols right there. Okay, so make sure you draw those, have those in your note. Okay, uh, the top one is an air. That's a single acting spring return, not double acting. The symbol is correct. The verbiage should not say double acting cylinder spring return. It should say single acting cylinder spring return. Okay, and then the bottom one is correct. Double rod cylinder, double acting. So you should be able to draw that one. The telescoping cylinder, double acting and single acting. How do you know it's double and single? Look at the very bottom of each drawing. The double acting has two ports. The single acting has one port. Okay? So different types of cylinder applications. Cylinders can work at an angle to a load. All right, we have two components to the workload at an angle. So this is where a trig comes into play later on and some math. Okay, hopefully you know your Soka Toa. But if you understand that when we talk about, you know, um, horizontal forces and vertical forces, Anytime we talk about a horizontal force, we're talking about cosine. Anytime we talk about a vertical force, we're talking about sine. If you can relate those two mathematically, you won't have too much of a challenge in this problem. Okay? So horizontal force is the cylinder force is the force load times cosine of the angle. Okay? And the vertical force is the bearing force, right? It's the force load times sine of the angle. 
Okay, and you can take a look at the force diagrams there as we go through there. So we'll do a couple examples. A cylinder mounted at 60 degrees to the horizontal is required to lift a weight of 15,000 pounds. What is the force the cylinder needs to generate? All right, so we have to determine the angle. We've got to take 90 minus 60. Because that 60 is to the horizontal, that 60 does not represent A. We have to find A by making a right triangle. So if we make a right triangle, we know it's 90 minus 60, which is 30. So the A is 30. Next, we substitute in our values. So it ends up just being 15,000 pounds cosine of 30. Make sure your calculator is in degrees mode to do this problem, not radians, or you will get the wrong answer. So right now, plug this into your calculator and make sure you're getting the same values that I have. Okay? So that's how you're going to approach that problem. Okay? If we want to talk about the other cylinder force, the bearing force, it's going to be 15,000 sine of 30. So there's how we calculate the two different forces. Okay? the cylinder force and the bearing force. When we take a look at those two, okay? Lastly, you might get a problem like this. A horizontally mounted cylinder is required to extend against a load of 5,000 pounds. That is an angle of 20 degrees to the cylinder axis. The cylinder has a bore diameter of two inches. What is the required pressure? So remember, pressure is force over area. We've got to do some calculations for that one. Um, this is, you know, if, if we're pushing something and it has to go at an angle, okay? So in this case, that angle is 20, okay? So we calculate our force first. So it's 5,000 cosine of 20. Remember, keeping your calculators in degrees mode, okay? And then we have to calculate the area. I'm not going through that part. And then we have to calculate pressure as force over area. So the force that we calculated in the first part of the problem divided by the area, and we get 1495 PSI. All right, we have a rotating lever arm used by a clevis mount, which is a hinge and pin, which is kind of shown here, okay? The net force on the lever arm is perpendicular to the lever arm. So in this case, it's the lever force is the cylinder force times cosine of A. Okay, where does this come into play? All right, so we've got an engine crane or something like that right here, all right? We've got to be careful in how that torque is actually calculated. But this is essentially... You know, uh, what we've got going on here is that, is that cylinder pushes up or down, okay? So this is our pivot point, which is L, okay? So you can kind of see where that pivot point is in the picture here. That's the length of the arm, okay? So torque is just going to be our force times our length, okay? Force times our length. All right, so we have a cylinder with 200 millimeter bore. It rotates a 400 millimeter lever arm in a system with a maximum operating pressure of 18,000 kPa. Determine the maximum force of the lever when the angle between the cylinder axis and the perpendicular of the lever arm is 65 degrees. What is the maximum torque of the lever arm at this instant? All right, so lots of things going on in this problem. First things first, find the area. So you got to convert that 200 millimeters to meters. Move the decimal place three places to the left. Next, calculate our force. Okay, in this case, it's just going to be pressure times area. Okay, be careful when we're because we're finding the cylinder force here, not the lever arm piece. Okay, and just in that calculation. So now we find the lever force, which is the cylinder force, which we calculate in the other part times cosine of the angle. This is where we have to use the angle. So we got to calculate two different forces here. Okay, the cylinder force, which doesn't have an angle, that one is zero, right? So we know that in that case, it, that number is irrelevant, so it's just pressure times area. In this case, where we find the lever, that's where we have to use the angle. Okay, so we get 239 newtons for that force, and then we use the torque equation, the lever force times the length. So it's 239, we had to turn that 400 millimeters into meters, so it's 0.4 meters, all right? So our maximum torque is going to be 95.61 newton meters, okay? Take a look at basic cylinder specifications, all right? So if you're buying a cylinder to, or you're designing a system that uses it, okay? There's, uh, you know, some different types of cylinders used in mobile and industrial. There's mill-type cylinders, so those are in industrial, 
They're heavy duty construction. And those are the ones that are able to operate continuously. In a factory, all right, it has to be able to operate continuously. When you size a cylinder, you have to size it on its bore. Okay, we've talked about that previously towards the beginning of the lecture. The stroke length, right, that's the difference between the fully retracted and fully extended length, usually in one inch increments and for imperial, okay? The rod size, one standard rod diameter for each bore size or several rod sizes for each bore size. So we can kind of handle it uh, either or in that scenario, okay? We have different mounting styles, all right? And that's just how we actually connect it to things. You know, if we have fixed, which hold them in place. So if we look at like our lugs or our flange, our flush side mounting type scenario where we have here, where we literally bolt it into place, okay? Or we have rod ties on the end there, all right? Helping things hold in place. Or we have the pivot, we have the clevis and the trunian Okay, and you can see where the clevis is there, where it actually rotates kind of around. So those are the different mounting styles we have for cylinders, and you'll be able to see them as we go through class, and you, know, you guys are going to program them in the PLCs uh, and all of that as well. So you'll get to see all those all right, as we go around. Last couple of specs, all right, common pressure ratings, anywhere from 1,000 PSI to 5,000 PSI. Um, we generally design them, you want at least a safety factor of four, which means... A cylinder won't fail until it reaches four times its pressure rating, all right? So if it goes above, a little above its pressure rating for one reason or another, it will not fail. But a safety factor of four has to reach four times that to fail. And then if you have a pressure spike, okay, that's when pressure suddenly jumps high due to a sudden shift or things like that. So be able to handle those different things. All right, guys, well, that's the end of Chapter 4. Uh, we're going to do a bunch of labs, uh, extending and retracting cylinders and that sort of thing. Eventually, we're going to program them in the PLC class as well. As usual, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Shoot me an email, else ask in class. Anyhow, see you guys in class. Have a great day.